Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, Idaho. Hope you're having a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you're listening to this. Welcome to the 2022 Local Yokel Idaho Christmas episode. So if you couldn't tell from the intro, the podcast is a little different. I'll bring you up to speed if you didn't hear it last week, but this episode is going to be different than the last couple weeks, partly for a couple reasons. One, I wanted it to be easier this week, (laughs) if I'm being frankly honest, that I could have a little bit of a break for the holiday season to spend it with family and not be uh, as stressed as I usually am about trying to get these episodes out on time. Two... You know, it's kind of surprising. You would think that it would be really busy, but during Christmas and after Christmas, there's really not a lot going on. Kind of weird. It's almost like people don't want to be doing events and stuff, and they want to be spending it with family during Christmas. I mean, kind of a weird thing that people would like to do that. But there's just not a lot of stuff this week after Christmas, and so I thought that's another reason not to do a full podcast or normal one. And number three, I thought I'd do something special. If there's any time of the year, this is one of them where we can kind of go a little bit off script, do something a little bit different, something special for the holiday season to celebrate it. I know a lot of the podcasts, the intro has had holiday music, and I've just kind of kept it the same to keep the thing rolling. Um, But it's a perfect excuse, I think, to do something special for the Christmas season and to make something special for the whole family. And I hope you enjoy this podcast and it is fulfilling for your Christmas season and that, you know, everyone that's listening to this can get something from it. With that said, here's the layout of kind of what we're going to be doing for the podcast today since it's a little bit different. Uh, First off, we're going to start off with 10 interesting facts about Christmas. I did a little bit of research about just some interesting, fun facts about the holiday season. Um, And then secondly, a reading of the Bible story of Christmas. And then number three, I picked out two presidential speeches about Christmas that I thought were really great and I wanted to read and share with you all about the Christmas season. And I think they would be just wonderful to enjoy. So with any further ado, let's get into the rest of the podcast. Starting off with our first interesting fact for Christmas, the Dutch started the tradition of leaving milk and cookies for Santa. I thought this was kind of interesting. I thought it was more of like a American thing to do it because, you know, we've all kind of heard the stories and stuff kind of dating back to the 1940s and 50s about that and kind of just really brought up in um, American Hollywood, shall we say. But it's really cool that the Dutch have started that. Uh, Number two, the biggest shopping day of the year is not Black Friday, but actually the two days before Christmas, which makes sense as much as all of us would like to be really responsible and always on it and have all of our shopping done and we're not stressing about Christmas or anything. I know a lot of us, myself included, have reached that point where we're stressfully kind of the last week or even days before Christmas kind of running around with our heads cut off trying to get those last couple gifts and stuff and kind of going along with that, the Christmas season kind of is one of those ones where you kind of have to spend money. They're, even the people that normally wouldn't spend money and are very frugal will usually splurge on the Christmas season and stuff. So I can see why that's a bit larger, but still that's a, that's amazing to see that Black Friday is beat out by the f- two days before Christmas. Uh, number three, Jingle Bells was originally a Thanksgiving song, which I personally, I, I, I don't know if I've said it on here before, but I feel like we should have more Thanksgiving songs, that Thanksgiving should be a bigger thing and not relegated to being this like speed bump before kind of the Christmas season starts kicking off. But I do have to admit, I think Jingle Bells is way more suited for the latter colder half of the year and for the season for Christmas and all that and everything. And I think it was a good switch that that was made. And then number four, the Christmas wreath is a symbol of Christ. The holly represents the crown of thorns Jesus wore and the berries for the blood he shed, which I thought was interesting. I had never knew of that symbolism when it came to like the wreath and Christ. Um, And so I thought it was worth sharing. It was very interesting. And then number five, Jamestown settlers created the first batch of eggnog. I didn't know this. I I think eggnog is like an international thing that has gone out to the rest of the world. I thought it was going to be something from Europe that like maybe a British tradition or like Swedish or something. But no, it was something invented here in America. So I guess we can say we have added something. It's something that is actually beneficial to the world. I mean, it is very sweet in American taste. You know, we don't care much about our health here in America. So <laughs> um, we're definitely going to make for the seasonal drink something that's not quite as healthy, but still very, very good. And then number six, 
uh, ham ranks as the top meat eaten on Christmas, according to Google data trends. So kind of a little bit misleading, but let me unpack this here. When I was doing the research for this, it was shown that in the month of December, the searches for like how to cook ham and then like searches for where to get ham and what stores carry it and all that and everything like go up exponentially during Christmas, which I think is not a bad logic to say that most people are getting ready to have ham for Christmas. I think of ham for Christmas personally. I know other people do it kind of like differently, but um, I think it's a good way to, I guess, kind of correlate that, that maybe ham is the number one thing eaten at Christmas dinners. Um, I mean, let me know on Twitter or send me an email in and we'll talk about it next year. That's when the next podcast will be out about what is the main meat. Do you guys have turkey? Do you have chicken? Do you have ham? Or do you go out and eat somewhere else for Christmas? What What is your main kind of top meat eaten at your Christmas traditionally? And then number seven, candy canes started out in Germany. And then following that number, number eight, kind of related to that, during Christmas, 1.76 billion, billion with a B, candy canes are made on average, which is just maddening to think about with a B, billion, 1.76 billion. That is a ton of candy canes. But honestly, I can kind of see it that like during the Christmas season, when you go around and you're just kind of walking around and interacting with different events and stuff, candy canes are like everywhere. You get to a certain point, like the end of the Christmas season where you just like the, if you have like one of those key bowls in the, when you enter into your home, that it's just full of like candy canes or wrappers or stuff or uh, spearmints and different like candy colored stuff that it just is everywhere. So I could totally see that being the case, but still crazy to think. But another thing with a billion is number nine, the U S postal office anticipates delivering more than 15 billion items of holiday mail every Christmas. This includes 850 million packages, which is just mind blowing. This is just the U S we're not talking about the rest of the world. That is just, that is mind-boggling. I mean, I do understand that, yes, the U.S. Postal Office has a lot of bureaucracy and it's slow at times and it's inefficient and all these things that we always talk about. And I'm not saying those aren't true and don't have merit, but I got to give them a hand. When you're moving 15 billion items in a 30-day period, like a month, right? That is just crazy. And they still pull it off where you're getting shipments that are under, you know, a week arriving at their destination. And this isn't just accounting for like Amazon. This is just the U.S. Postal Office. You know, I have no idea the amount of items that are being shipped through Amazon and UPS and FedEx. It would be crazy to see if someone found that data and like compiled what total in just the continental United States, the amount of shipments that go on on Christmas. If it's just 15 billion for the U.S. Postal Office, it's crazy. But then again, I could see where that could be weirdly inflated because like the amount of Christmas cards if they're counting those, then it's kind of, I guess, a double standard because other places like UPS and FedEx aren't dealing with uh, Christmas cards and stuff, which can be far more. So, but yeah, still interesting, really interesting fact. And then coming into number 10, the three traditional colors of Christmas are a symbol of Christ, red for the blood of Jesus, green for his resurrection, and gold as his title of King of Kings which I know as we kind of get into that in closing here in the interesting facts that Christmas originally was not like a Christian holiday, that it was adapted and taken over and kind of in the Middle Ages and turned into a Christian holiday. But I personally don't see that as an issue. I mean, Halloween is a perfect example of that. That's something that its original intent in Mexico and Spain and different stuff where it originated has vastly changed since its creation. And I don't think that's a bad thing. It is something that it has morphed and changed and adapted with time and people have created it into something else that they love and enjoy and that mirrors something great about the season and something worth celebrating. Kind of like Thanksgiving has not always been around, but it has been made into this thing that is important in the North American continent and is celebrated. And I think that's a great thing. And I think having that symbolism about Christ, something that is truly glorifying, something that truly is good, is a good thing to have. And it's cool to learn about a lot of the symbolism. I know one of the things I didn't talk about, I think the candy cane has some symbolism to it as well. I didn't know about the wreath thing. That's why I included it. But this is another cool one. Um, to see with the blood, the red being the blood of Jesus, the green being as resurrection, the gold being the title of King of Kings. I just thought it was worth sharing. And it's not bad, I think, that it has Christian roots and it was kind of adapted in the past. But we'll move on to the rest of the podcast here.
moving into the second part of the podcast here, I'm going to do a reading of the Bible story of Christmas. I have no doubt some of you that are listening to this are not Christians or have a faith, and that's fine. I would still recommend you listening to it because it's part of the tradition of the Christmas season that we have, that it's celebrated for the birth of Christ. And I think it would be wonderful for you to hear and hear about the message and the story about it of someone or just this general story that has influenced millions of people's lives and has changed the world, I would argue, for the better if you look at it. But we'll start off here in Matthew 1, 15 through 25 and Matthew 2. I'm going to be doing two parts there. And then there's going to be a third part, Luke, that I'm going to be going through. So we'll start off here. Matthew chapter 1, verse 15. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This all took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and called his name Jesus. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 21. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world would be registered. This was the first registration when Crinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with his with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapping him in swaddling clothes and laying him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. And when the angel went out from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And then they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at the shep- what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherd returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and all that had been told. At the end of the eighth day, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, this name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Moving on into the third part of this Christmas podcast, Christmas speeches. I've picked two of them because I just couldn't decide between them. This first one is Ronald Reagan's 1981 Christmas speech. We'll be going through paragraphs one through nine and 28 and 30. The reason there's a gap there is that the main center part of the podcast is about a situation that was going on in Poland at that time during the Cold War and different stuff. And I felt the reason that we're reading the speech is not as much about the history and stuff, but more about the message of Christmas and its inspiration, less about that kind of history. If you want to listen to the whole thing, you can, but I've cut those parts out because it was just basically a bunch of political talk. And we don't, don't really, I didn't really want that for Christmas. I wanted it to be a speech about Christmas. So I cut those parts out. And so we'll be doing paragraph one through nine and 28 to 30. So we'll skip nine to 28 um, on that. December 23rd, 1981. Good evening. At Christmas time, every home takes on a special beauty, a special warmth that's certainly true for the White House, where so many famous Americans have spent their Christmas over the years. This fine old home, the People's House, has been so much a part of our lives and history. 
It has been humbling and inspiring for Nancy and me to spend our first Christmas in this place. We've lived here as tenants for almost a year now, and what a year it's been. As a people, we've been through quite a lot. Moments of joy, of tragedy, and real achievement. Moments that I believe that have brought us closer together. G.K. Chesterton once said that the world would never starve for wonders, but only for the want of wonder. At this special time of year, we all renew our sense of wonder in recalling the story of the first Christmas in Bethlehem nearly 2,000 years ago. Some celebrate Christmas as a birth of a great and good philosopher and teacher. Others of us believe in the divinity of a child born in Bethlehem, that he was and is the promised Prince of Peace. Yes, we've questioned why he could come perform miracles, chose to come among us as a helpless babe, but maybe that was the first miracle, his first great lesson that we should learn to care for one another. Tonight, in millions of Americans' homes, the glow of the Christmas tree is a reflection of the love Jesus taught us, like the shepherd and the wise men that first Christmas. We Americans have always tried to follow a higher light, a star if you will, at lonely campfire vigils along the frontier, in the darkest days of the Great Depression through war and peace, the twin beacons of faith and freedom have brightened the American sky, and at times our footsteps may have faltered, but trusting in the Lord's help, we have never lost our way. Just across the way from the White House stands the great emblem of the holiday season, a menorah symbolizing the Jewish festival of Hanukkah and the national Christmas tree, a beautiful towering blue spruce from Pennsylvania. Like the national Christmas tree, our country is living, growing thing planted in the rich American soil. Only our devoted care can bring it to flower. So let this holiday season be for us a time of rededication. As we rejoice, however, let us remember that some Americans, this will not be a happy Christmas as it should be. I know a little of what they feel. I remember one Christmas Eve during the Great Depression, my father opened what he thought was a Christmas greeting. It was a notice that he no longer had a job. Over the past year, we've begun the long, hard work of economic recovery. Our goal is an America in which every citizen who needs and wants a job can get a job. Our program for recovery has been in place for 12 weeks now, and it has begun to work. With your help and prayers, it will succeed. We're winning the battle against inflation and runaway government spending and taxation, and that victory will mean more economic growth, more jobs, and more opportunity for all Americans. A few months before he took up residence in this house, one of my predecessors, John Kennedy, tried to sum up the temper of the times with a quote from an author closely tied to Christmas, Charles Dickens. We were living, he said, in the best of times and the worst of times. Well, in some ways, that's even more true today. The world is full of peril as well as promise to many of its people even now, living in the shadow of want and tyranny. Paragraph 28 through 30. Once earlier in this century, an evil force threatened the light going out all over the world. The light of millions of candles in Americans' homes giving notice the light of freedom is not going to be extinguished. We are blessed with a freedom and an abundance denied to so many. Let those candles remind us that these blessings bring with them a solid obligation, an obligation to God who guides us, an obligation to the heritage of liberty and dignity handed down to us by our forefathers, and an obligation to the children of the world whose future will be shaped by the ways we live our lives today. Christmas means so much because of one special child, but Christmas also reminds us that all children are special, that they are all gifts from God, gifts beyond price that mean more than any present money can buy. And their love and laughter and our hopes for their future lies the true meaning of Christmas. So in the spirit of gratitude for what we have been able to achieve together over the past year and looking forward to all that we hope to achieve together in the years ahead, Nancy and I want to wish you all the best of holiday seasons. As Charles Dickens, whom I quoted a few moments ago, said so well in his Christmas carol, God bless us, everyone. Good night. This next speech and final speech comes from Franklin D. Roosevelt in his 1942 Christmas speech. I'm going to keep this one in its entirety. There is going to be some stuff about World War II that is unrelated, but I felt like trying to cut it up would take away from the speech in its entirety, so I'm just going to read it in its whole. So please bear with the parts that are not related today, but there are wonderful parts in it. December 24th, 1942. This year I am speaking on Christmas Eve not to the gathering at the White House only, but to all the citizens of our nation. 
to the men and women serving in our American armed forces and also to those who wear the uniform of other United Nations. I give to you a message of cheer. I cannot say Merry Christmas for I think constantly of those thousands of soldiers and sailors who are in actual combat throughout the world. But I can express to you my thought that this is a happier Christmas than last year and the sense is that the forces of darkness standing against us with less confidence in success of their evil ways. To you who toil in industry for the common cause of helping to win the war, I send a message of cheer that you can well continue to sacrifice without recognition and with a look of Christmas cheer, kindly spirit towards your fellow man. To you who serve in uniform, I also send a message of cheer that you are in the thoughts of your families and friends at home and that Christmas prayers follow you wherever you may be. To all Americans, I say that loving our neighbor as we love ourselves is not enough that as a nation and as individuals will please God best but by showing regard for the laws of God. There is no better way of fostering goodwill toward men than to first foster goodwill toward God. If we love him, we will keep his commandments. In sending Christmas greetings to the armed forces and merchant sailors of the United Nations are included therein our pride and their bravery and fighting fronts on all seas. But we remember in our greeting and in our pride those other men who guard remote islands and bases and will in all probability never come into active combat with the common enemy. They are stationed in distant places far from home. They have few contacts within the outside world. And I want them to know that their work is essential to the conduct of the war, essential to ultimate victory, and that we have not forgotten them. It is significant that tomorrow, Christmas Day, our plants and factories will be still. That is not true of other holidays we have long been accustomed to celebrating. On all other holidays, work goes on gladly for the winning of the war. So Christmas becomes the only holiday in all the year. I like to think this is so because Christmas is a holy day. May all it stand for life and growing throughout the years. I hope you like these speeches. If you want to see the scripts that I got them from, then you can look at the links that I'll have below. On the flip side, if you really want to hear them in their original voices, which in my opinion are far better than my humble uh, voice, I would highly recommend going over to YouTube and listening to them yourselves.